such a penalty, or of being prepared to take the law into our own hands if it were withheld. Now, what applies to this extreme case also applies in due degrees to the other cases. Offences in which sex is concerned are often needlessly magnified by penalties, ranging from various forms of social ostracism to long sentences of penal servitude, which would seem to be monstrously disproportionate to the real feeling against them if the removal of both the penalties and the taboo on their discussion made it possible for us to ascertain their real prevalence and estimation. Fortunately, there is one outlet for the truth. We are permitted to discuss in jest what we may not discuss in earnest. A serious comedy about sex is taboo. A farcical comedy is privileged. The favourite subject of farcical comedy. This little piece which follows this preface accordingly takes the form of a farcical comedy, because it is a contribution to the very extensive dramatic literature which takes as its special department the gallantries of married people. The stage has been preoccupied by such affairs for centuries, not only in the jesting vein of restoration comedy and palais royal farce, but in the more tragically turned adulteries of the Parisian school, which dominated the stage until Ibsen put them out of their countenance and relegated them to their proper place as articles of commerce. Their continued vogue in that department maintains the tradition that adultery is the dramatic subject par excellence, and indeed a play that is not about adultery is not a play at all. I was considered a heresiac of the most extravagant kind when I expressed my opinion at the outset of my career as a playwright that adultery is the dullest of themes on the stage, and that from Francesca and Poilo down to the latest guilty couple of the school of Dumas Fils, the romantic adulterers have all been intolerable bores. The Pseudo-Sex Play Later on, I had the occasion to point out to the defenders of sex as the proper theme of drama, that though they were right in ranking sex as an intensely interesting subject, they were wrong in assuming that sex is an indispensable motive in popular plays. The plays of Molière are, like the novels of the Victorian Epoch or Don Quixote, nearly as sexless as anything not absolutely inhuman can be. And some of Shakespeare's plays are sexually on a par with the census. They contain women as well as men, and that is all. This had to be admitted, but it was still assumed that the plays of the 19th century Parisian school are, in contrast with the sexless masterpieces, saturated with sex. And this I strenuously denied. A play about the convention that a man should fight a duel or come to fisticuffs with his wife's lover if she has one, or the convention that he should strangle her like Othello, or turn her out of the house and never see her or allow her to see her children again, or the convention that she should never be spoken to again by any decent person and should finally drown herself, or the convention that persons involved in scenes of recrimination or confession by these conventions should call each other certain abusive names and describe their conduct as guilty and frail and so on. All these may provide material for very effective plays, but such plays are not dramatic studies of sex. One might as well say that Romeo and Juliet is a dramatic study of pharmacy because the catastrophe is brought upon through an apothecary. Duels are not sex. Divorce cases are not sex. The trade unionism of married women is not sex. Only the most insignificant fraction of the gallantries of married people produce any of the conventional results and plays occupied wholly with the conventional results are therefore utterly unsatisfying as sex plays, 
however interesting they may be as plays of intrigue and plot puzzles. The world is finding this out rapidly. The Sunday papers, which in the days when they appealed almost exclusively to the lower middle class, were crammed with police intelligence, and more especially with divorce and murder cases, now lay no stress on them. And police papers, which confined themselves entirely to such matters, and were once eagerly read, have perished through the essential dullness of their topics. And yet the interest in sex is stronger than ever. In fact, the literature that has driven out the journalism of the divorce courts is a literature occupied with sex to an extent and with an intimacy and frankness that would have seemed utterly impossible to Thackeray or Dickens if they had been told that the change would complete itself within fifty years of their own time. Art and Morality It is ridiculous to say, as inconsiderate amateurs of the arts do, that art has nothing to do with morality. What is true is that the artist's business is not that of the policeman, and that such factitious consequences and put-up jobs as divorces and executions and the detective operations that lead up to them are no essential parts of life. Though, like poisons and buttered slides and red-hot pokers, they provide material for plenty of thrilling or amusing stories suited to people who are incapable of any interest in psychology. But the fine artists must keep the policeman out of his studies of sex and studies of crime. It is by clinging nervously to the policeman that most of the pseudo-sex plays convince me that the writers of either never had any serious personal experience of their ostensible subject, or else have never conceived it possible that the stage door present the phenomena of sex as they appear in nature. The Limits of Stage Presentation But the stage presents much more shocking phenomena than those of sex. There is, of course, a sense in which you cannot present sex on the stage, just as you cannot present murder. Macbeth must no more really kill Duncan than he must himself really be slain by Macduff. But the feelings of a murderer can be expressed in a certain artistic convention, and a carefully prearranged sword exercise can be gone through with sufficient pretense of earnestness to be accepted by the willing imaginations of the younger spectators as a desperate combat. The tragedy of love has been presented on the stage in the same way. In Tristan and Isolde, the curtain does not, as in Romeo and Juliet, rise with the lark. The whole night of love is played before the spectators. The lovers do not discuss marriage in an elegantly sentimental way. They utter the visions and feelings that come to lovers at the supreme moments of their love totally forgetting that there are such things in the world as husbands and lawyers and dueling codes and theories of sin and notions of propriety and all the other irrelevancies which provide hackneyed and bloodless material for our so-called plays of passion. Pruderies of the French Stage To all stage productions there are limits. If Macduff were to stab Macbeth, the spectacle would be intolerable, and even the pretense which we allow on our stage is ridiculously destructive to the illusion of the scene. Yet pugilists and gladiators will actually fight and kill in public without sham, even as a spectacle for money. But no sober couple of lovers of any delicacy could endure to be watched. We in England, accustomed to consider the French stage much more licentious than the British, are always surprised and puzzled when we learn, as we may do any day if we come within reach of such information, that French actors are often scandalised by what they consider the indecency of the English stage, 
and that French actresses who desire a greater license in appealing to the sexual instincts than the French stage allows them, learn and establish themselves on the English stage. The German and Russian stages are in the same relation to the French, and perhaps more or less all the Latin stages. The reason is that, partly from a want of respect for the theatre, partly from a sort of respect for art in general, which moves them to accord moral privileges to artists, partly from the very objectionable tradition that the realm of art is Alsatia, and the contemplation of works of art a holiday from the burden of virtue, partly because French prudery does not attach itself to the same points of behaviour as British prudery and has a different code of the mentionable and the unmentionable. And, for many other reasons, the French tolerate plays which are never performed in England until they have been spoiled by a process of bowdlerisation. Yet French taste is more fastidious than ours as to the exhibition and treatment on the stage of the physical incidents of sex. On the French stage, a kiss is as obvious a convention as the thrust under the arm by which Macduff runs Macbeth through. It is even a purposely unconvincing convention, the actors rather insisting that it shall be impossible for any spectator to mistake a stage kiss for a real one. In England, on the contrary, Realism is carried to the point at which nobody except the two performers can perceive that the caress is not genuine. And here the English stage is certainly right, for whatever question there arises as to what incidents are proper for representation on the stage or not, my experience as a playgoer leaves me in no doubt that once it is decided to represent an incident, it will be offensive, no matter whether it be a prayer or a kiss, unless it is presented with a convincing appearance of sincerity. Our Disillusive Scenery For example, the main objection to the use of elusive scenery, in most modern plays scenery is not elusive, everything visible is as real as in your drawing room, is that it is unconvincing, whilst the imaginary scenery with which the audience provides a platform or tribune like the Elizabethan stage or the Greek stage used by Sophocles is quite convincing. In fact, the more scenery you have, the less illusion you produce. The wise playwright, when he cannot get absolute reality of presentation, goes to the other extremes and aims at atmosphere and suggestion of mood, rather than at direct simulative illusion. The theatre, as I first knew it, was a place of wings and flats, which destroyed both atmosphere and illusion. This was tolerated, and even intensely enjoyed, but not in the least because nothing better was possible, for all the devices employed in the productions of Mr. Granville Barker or Max Reinhardt or the Moscow Art Theatre were equally available for the Colisibber and Garrick, except the intensity of our artificial light. When Garrick played Richard II in slashed trunk hose and plumes, it was not because he believed that the Plantagenets dressed like that, or because the costumes could not have made him a fifteenth-century dress as easily as a nondescript combination of the state robes of George III with such scraps of older fashions as seemed to playgoers for some reason to be romantic. The charm of the theatre in those days was its make-believe. It has that charm still, not only for the amateurs, who are happiest when they are most unnatural and impossible and absurd, but for audiences as well. I have seen performances of my own plays which were to me far wilder burlesques than Sheridan's Critic or Buckingham's Rehearsal. Yet they have produced sincere laughter and tears 
such as the most finished metropolitan productions have failed to elicit. <laughs> 